Chitu Fehadens and Finnegan here to dive back into the cookbook. In this chapter, we are talking about important yet commonly overlooked camera mounts and how that reflects on your lens choices. We're also looking at flange to sensor distance, which recently has been making an appearance among mainstream subjects, but it's still somewhat shrouded in secrecy and confusion. Here in module three, we're talking about all things camera for anamorphic shooting. In the previous chapters, I covered anamorphic modes, frame guides or crop marks, and the impact of your sensor size, whether you're using a focal reducer or not. If you're a member of the channel, you're getting this content early and you rock. If you're not a member, you can unlock at least four more videos, possibly cookbook chapters, right now by signing up. Besides getting a direct line of communication with me and a Discord server full of cool people to share your findings with. Let's begin with the math. Understanding flange to sensor distance will make it easier to understand mounts in a bit. Plus, you have a good foundation from the appendix to module two on the flange distance checker. When looking at any camera, you can always see this symbol. This is the film plane indicator, a mark for the placement of the sensor inside the camera. If you cut your camera in half, this is where you'll find your sensor. This is where your lens projects the focused picture. And in a healthy camera, your lens is connected to the body through the mount. The space between the mount and the sensor is what's called flange distance. Every mount has its own flange distance. That doesn't mean some of them can't be the same. For example, the L mount and the RF mount both have a 20 millimeter flange. This is a technical number and not a creative decision. Still, all lenses with an L mount are designed to project a focus image 20 millimeters behind them. You can even see that without a camera just on the counter. For reference, here are some common flange distances. When using native lenses, this doesn't matter at all. At its core, your flange distance will define how versatile your camera is when adapting lenses designed for other systems. A shorter flange mount will always be compatible with a longer flange system. For example, it's very easy to make an adapter from L mount to EF. To achieve infinity focus on an EF lens, we need it to sit 44 millimeters away from the sensor or film. Using an L mount camera, we have full 24 millimeters of air gap between the camera body and the lens. This is where the adapter comes in. Adapters are nothing but glorified tubes. When using electronic lenses and high-tech stuff, they can also control autofocus between different protocols and brands, but for most of what we're seeing here, they're just acting as spacers. The tough part about flange distance is when you have a lens designed for a short flange, Suray, for example, designed for micro four thirds, at 19.25 millimeters, and you want to fit it to a camera body that requires way more space, like Canon EF at 44 millimeters. I've made a video about this already where these animations come from. In most cases, it's impossible or not viable to adapt a shorter flange lens to a longer flange camera, simply because you can't fit that lens that deep inside of the body. Stop asking me about Suray and EF. Swear. This is the main reason why I choose mirrorless cameras and mounts for my work, like MFT or L instead of bodies fit with the all popular EF mount, for example, simply because I can use a wider variety of lenses. To make matters worse, the tolerances on these distances are very small, like hundreds of a millimeter. That's actually how much your flange to sensor distance can be off and not introduce major image quality issues. One to two hundredths of a millimeter. That's one tenth of the thickness of a sheet of paper. If the flange to sensor distance in my L mount camera is 20.02 millimeters instead of exact 20 millimeters, I'm already prone to see some softer infinity focus. 
And if you watch chapter three of module two, where we talked about how anamorphics focus, you should remember the critical role that having perfect infinity focus plays in anamorphic lenses, but less so with adapters. In a short recap, if your infinity focus is a bit off due to your flange to sensor distance being inaccurate, your anamorphic block performance is much more compromised than a spherical lens would be. And this degradation happens not only in infinity, but throughout the entire range. Basically, if your flange distance is less than perfect when shooting with an anamorphic lens, one component of your system is always out of focus, and you're always gonna be wondering why the footage looks off. That's why products like the Dens FDC exist, to measure and help you calibrate this distance. When I had the Dens, I checked my Panasonic bodies and they were within spec and had no measurable impact in performance. But some of my PL adapters were off and needed shims. Shims are these very thin spacers that you can add to carefully control the distance to the sensor. Some lenses will give you shims for adjusting back focus, some adapters will accept shims. In production level cameras like RED or Alexa will allow you to adjust the sensor position natively, which is by far the best solution to correct bad flange to sensor distance. If you want even more flange distance information and an extensive research into the tolerances observed in cine cameras, consumer, mirrorless, and DSLR bodies, I highly recommend reading Roger Sakala's The Great Flange to Sensor Distance article and our own module two, chapter six video. A combination of flange to sensor distance with lens mounts is what ultimately defines which lenses are compatible with which cameras. For example, while our F and L mounts share the same flange distance of 20 millimeters, I can't easily adapt an RF lens to an L mount body or vice versa. That was the whole challenge with Suray's native MFT lens mount and fitting that to L mount bodies like the Panasonic S5 or S1H. Adapting mounts with similar flange to sensor distances requires more engineering than a simple ring or a tube adapter. So what's a good core mount? As popular as PL is in the cine world, and we'll talk more about PL in a bit. I found that the indie or the budget universe to be much friendlier to EF mounts. I'd go as far as calling it a poor man's PL, considering how many lens makers offer EF lenses and how many other great lenses can be easily and reliably adapted to it, like Canon FD, Contax Yashica, and Leica R. All of those are also going up in prices and becoming popular in the cinema world thanks to rehousings. A few minutes ago, I favored mirrorless cameras, and just now, I said EF is a good core mount. What's up with that? I'm aiming for EF on my lenses, as they can fit multiple camera platforms, and lots of cine cameras will come in EF mounts as well, such as RED, Canon C-Line, and even Alexa's have adapters to fit EF lenses. Having all my lenses in EF mount will allow me not only to fit all my cameras, either MFT or L mount, but also rent them out to other productions quite easily. Talking about rent is the perfect segue into PL. Created by Ari in 1982, PL stands for positive lock, which means that the camera locks the lens in place instead of the lens clicking into position like what we have on pretty much anything else. This type of mount will create a rock solid connection between lens and camera body, preventing warping, tilting, and most importantly, play on the lens mount. Play on the mount will ruin your anamorphic footage. If the connection between the camera and the adapter or the adapter and the lens is even a little bit loose, your lens will move around when you focus or zoom or just hold it. Back in 2018, a little play in my adapter ruined most of the footage I shot for reviewing the Atlas Orion 40mm. Recently, I also showcased how this play can affect your flange to sensor distance and optical performance. That's why PL style adapters are becoming more popular. Offered by Metabones, Zcam, and a few others, these introduce positive lock type of mechanism for non-PL mounts, 
securing lenses much more tightly than their regular counterparts. With all of that in mind, when knowing your limitations, there's nothing better than avoiding adapters altogether. Like what we see with Vazen's MFT native mounts or Suray's lenses. Optics designed for a shorter flange to sensor distance make for smaller and lighter lenses. And if you're going that route, you'll want to save space and weight wherever you can, as we'll cover in module four, talking about spherical or taking lenses. Now you should be able to make sense of your choice for a camera mount, its flange to sensor distance, and how these will affect your lens choices, anamorphic or spherical. And how precise you have to be when using mount adapters, always favoring the ones that allow for adjustments. On the next chapter, we'll talk about the best ways to monitor a de-squeezed image on set, be it on camera or on various tiers of external monitors. Seeing the frame properly is of huge value to your work and your client's understanding of what you're doing. I can't tell how many times I've had directors and other team members confused when staring at a squeezed picture. But that's for the next one. If you learned something new here today, remember to subscribe. I'd love to see some of you going over your camera and mount choices in the comments below to make this an engaging conversation. I hope you're enjoying watching these videos as much as I enjoy making them. Shoot the feathers out.